are given but from the Lord's perspective it was a public declaration that he was the Messiah the anointed one now if you uh, look at Matthew 21 verses 1 to 11 you see different expressions as to who the Lord Jesus is for example in verse 3 and you may want to just underline these words in your Bible he is the master he is the master the Lord himself calls himself that master and then in verse 5 using our Old Testament prophecy he is the king the long awaited anticipated king he is the master he is the king and in verse 9 he is the son of David the Lord Jesus came from the Davidic line and he was going to, he's going to occupy the throne of David and one day he's going to establish uh, his universal kingdom here on earth so he's the son of David but from and then uh, verse 11 uh, he is called the prophet he is called the prophet so those are truths concerning the Lord Jesus but for you and for me today because we have the completed Bible our picture of the Lord Jesus is more comprehensive and uh, I was really amazed when I was studying this passage uh, I was wondering what does Hosanna in the highest mean and actually if you look at that uh, expression it means Hosanna to God most high in the heavens is actually admitting that God is the most high God so wow I said to myself wow here is the acknowledgement that Jesus is God most high here on earth uh, taking on human flesh so it's very important that we have the right concept of the Lord Jesus we just can't dismiss him as a good teacher or a moral worker a miracle worker no you can't dismiss him with those notions he is God most high who came to earth on a mission of saving humanity from their sins that's who the Lord Jesus is acknowledgement of the Messiah now that leads to point B in your notes appeal to the Messiah appeal to the Messiah and so the people cry out Hosanna 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 and what does that mean Lord save us now so Spurgeon put it this way save oh save save oh save this was a cry from the people for liberation they were under Roman occupation they were under the iron heel of Rome they were staggering and reeling and they wanted freedom they wanted independence and they look at the Lord Jesus and they say Lord now is the time to set the captive free Lord wipe out the Romans establish your kingdom and we as your favored treasured people now of course the Lord didn't come to wipe out the Romans he came to wipe out sin and uh, so uh, if you were to take uh, this expression Hosanna and put it into one sentence it would be what you see in your notes save we pray through the Lord Jesus God's King and Savior the rightful heir to the throne of David bring us under your rule God and your Salon that's a very beautiful prayer of salvation to pray for yourself and for me to pray for myself this is what ushers us into a personal relationship with God most high a prayer where we acknowledge our sin and we look to the Lord Jesus as our Savior now I said to myself one of the things we have been taught when we prepare sermons put yourself in that context put yourself in that first audience and if I was part of that large procession that large crowd how would I have prayed how would I have prayed 
So I gave it a lot of thought. I took a sheet of paper and before I knew it, I wrote out 12 prayers. And these are the 12 prayers I want to walk with you. This is the, these are the prayers that I would have prayed as an appeal to the Messiah. And you may have different prayers, but I'm almost sure these 12 prayers are going to resonate with you. So let's walk uh, through them one at a time. Number one, Lord, deliver me from my depravity. Lord, deliver me from my depravity. The word save means rescue. It means deliver. And you know what? All of us, if we are very honest with ourselves, the raging battle that we fight day in and day out is the internal battle. It is the battle with sin. The Bible says we are all born sinners and uh, we fight sin to the day we die. <laughs> uh, we fight sin in our thought life. We fight sin in our speech, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our activities. My goodness, just you name it, it's all over the place. We are all contaminated. We are all defined by sin. And uh, uh, doesn't matter how, how, how long we have been in the faith, we struggle. So that's why the Apostle Paul said on one occasion, O wretched man that I am. I always find that intriguing. He never said, oh, wonderful man that I am. <laughs> you know, that's how we describe each other, right? Oh, good guy, good guy, nice guy, nice person, right? Till you talk to the wife. <laughs> hey, some of you are laughing, right? Because you are living in the real world, <laughs> right? So we know it. We know that we are depraved, we are defiled, we are wayward sheep. We are children of disobedience and like King David, we all can say, my sin is always before me. Our holy moments are few and far between. Isn't that true? You sit and watch a, a program and my goodness, before you knew it, you are defiled. Right? You listen to the talk outside in the world and you are defiled. So, very pertinent prayer to pray, Lord, deliver me from my depravity. Now, close on the heels of that is the second prayer that I pray for myself, Lord, dispel darkness from my life. Lord, dispel darkness from my life. So the Lord Jesus said, men love darkness more than the light. That's who we are. We prefer the darkness to the light. So when are most crimes committed? In the darkness. When do people get drunk the most? In the darkness. Right? So when do sinful activities take place? Under the cover of darkness. And so Lord, dispel the darkness from my life. So. Uh, during the birth of the Lord Jesus, there is a very wonderful quotation given in Matthew. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And that's what the Lord Jesus came to do. To expel, to dispel the darkness of sin and the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of pollution. And uh, so why is it that I can't get through to God? Why is it that... Uh, God at times seems to be a foggy notion out there. It is because there is a cloud that comes in between me and God. A thick, dark, black cloud. And there is some darkness that is preventing me from seeing the Lord for who He is. So we need to constantly pray, O oh God, bathe my soul with your light. May my soul be flooded with your light. And the Lord Jesus claimed that he was the light of the world. And we are called to be people of light, not people of darkness. Satan's kingdom is called the kingdom of darkness. And when we repent and turn to the Lord Jesus, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's light. What a transformation. And that... Uh, Transformation has got to be reflected in our life day in and day out. So uh, to put it another way, God 
make me a person of integrity. God, may there be transparency in my life. May I not live a life of duplicity. May I not live a life of hypocrisy. Uh, what, are, what people see uh, in me is, should be reality. And uh, there should be uh, no sense of shame in my life because I have something to hide. I have skeletons in the closet. No. Lord, dispel darkness from my life. Prayer number three. Uh, all these prayers are interrelated, by the way. Deflate all pride in me. Deflate all pride in me. We are all like a balloon that is filled up with air. And uh, somebody has to come with a pin and prick the balloon so that uh, the air goes out and it bursts. And that's what has to happen in your life and my life. We are like that balloon filled up with pride. So what is pride? Pride is living a life independent of God. That is what pride is. Pride is basically asking the Lord very politely to mind his own business, not to interfere in our life. I call all the shots. I want to live my life my way. And I will uh, tip my hat to God once a Sunday and God had better be happy. That is pride, the height of pride. By the way, why did Lucifer the most awesome angel that God had created fall and become the devil. You know, it's a one word answer. Pride. Because of pride, Lucifer became the devil. And in any Bible commentary that you read, pride is always called the mother of all sins. It is pride that gives birth to all other sins in your life and my life. So how do I know I have pride in my life? Every time I don't admit that I am wrong, that's an expression of pride. Every time I go into denial, that's an expression of pride. Every time I am not teachable and I think I know it all, that's pride. Every time I am not correctable and I take offense, I get irritated, I get upset with people who are trying to show me there is something wrong in my life, that is pride. So beloved, this is a prayer for humility, if you look at it uh, positively. Prayer number three, Lord deflate all pride in me. Number four, Lord defeat the power of Satan. Lord, defeat the power of Satan. Now you may look at me and say, but pastor, you got that one wrong. Wasn't Satan defeated at the cross? And we are going to celebrate that this coming Friday, right? Yes, Satan was defeated at the cross, but Satan was not annihilated. Satan was not cast into the lake of fire. Satan is today still running around. He is still able to inflict damage. And so, even though Satan is defeated, he loves to get involved in skirmishes. It's almost like in today's terminology, guerrilla warfare. Right? The battle has been won, but there are still pockets of resistance here, there, there, there. And that's what we experience in our life. Lord, defeat the influencers of Satan in my life. So for example, if you take a passage like Ephesians 4, how do we know that Satan is active in our life? Are you ready? You ready or you want me to skip? Right, because all of you look very angelic from here. I don't want to spoil the party. Ephesians 4, <laughs> every time I get angry, and that anger is not controlled and it leads to yelling, screaming and throwing of plates. That is demonic activity in your life and my life. Say so in Ephesians 4. Every time I use bad, foul language and I become abusive in my speech, that's demonic activity in my life. Every time 
I waste time, time that should be given to God and to his kingdom and I use it for other purposes that is demonic activity in my life. Every time I abuse my body with substance abuse, that is demonic activity in my life. Beloved, I say this with a heavy heart. Every time you buy a bottle and take it to your home, you are taking the devil with you. Don't get angry. I am very concerned. We are inviting the powers of darkness into our home through those activities. And uh, I have also written uh, uh, in my notes, unforgiveness, Ephesians 4. Every time I harbor bitterness, resentment, I sulk, right? Uh, it is demonic activity in my life. So we, we all experience it in one form or the other. We all come under demonic influence, right? The wife says the truth about us, we get angry, we yell at her and we yell at the children. And the poor dog get kicks in the process, minding its own business. <laughs> right? That is demonic activity in my life. So, Lord, defeat the power of Satan that is seeking to exert its authority over my life. That's the prayer. Number five, Lord, turn doubt into assurance. Lord, turn doubt into assurance. You know, all of us are going to get plagued with doubt <laughs> at one time or the other. So Thomas in the Bible, we even today call him Doubting Thomas. He, he got a bad uh, repute uh, because of his doubting. John the Baptist, when he was in prison, he had doubts concerning who the Messiah was, right? So Thomas and uh, John the Baptist, just to mention a couple of examples in the Bible of uh, men of God who had moments of doubt in their life. I wrote in my notes three areas where I tend to doubt God. Now, this may not be true of you, but remember this is my personal prayer. I sat down, I took a sheet of paper, I said, Holy Spirit, show me. Uh, what kind of a prayer should I be praying uh, on Palm Sunday? I doubt God's love. There are times I doubt God's love, right? In a world where there is so much of wickedness and evil, did you hear today? Two churches were bombed in Egypt as they were worshipping the Lord on Palm Sunday. And you are tempted to ask the question, God, where are you? These are people who are in the house of God, celebrating Palm Sunday, just like what we are doing today. And we tend to God, uh, doubt God's love. I, I do. Then I tend to uh, doubt God's goodness. God's goodness. So, when things don't uh, work out good in my life, right? Uh, when uh, there are negative circumstances in my life, uh, I tend to doubt God's goodness. Psalm 23 says, goodness and mercy will accompany us every moment of our life. Psalm 23 says that goodness and mercy will dog our footsteps. But then in reality, <laughs> there are those moments when, if we are honest, we doubt God's goodness. Then of course, I doubt God's power. God, why is so and so hopelessly addicted to this particular sin? Why are they not set free, Lord? The wife is crying, the children are crying. Why is the guy not repenting? Why is the guy not turning his life around? Right? So I go to the prison, I visit the guys, see the repeat offenders, and uh, they look at me and they smile, repeat offenders. That's when you feel like giving them a Mike Tyson punch in the face. <laughs> hey, you should be crying. What is this man? What is this? Why are you coming back a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a tenth time? And I say, God, am I wasting my time? Where is your power to release these people from their sin, from their addictions? So we pray, I pray, Lord, take my doubts and turn them into assurance. Turn them into assurance. And again, very beautifully put by Spurgeon. I have given the quote for you in your notes. 
Admit the Lord into your heart. Ah, there is the secret. Why is it that we have all these doubts? Because we have not given admittance to the Lord in our life. Admit the Lord into your heart and the limping of your unbelief will be exchanged for the reapings of faith. You know, Spurgeon had a beautiful way of taking biblical spiritual truth and putting it in words that you and I can understand and identify with. That's Spurgeon. You admit the Lord into your life and all the limpings of unbelief are going to be exchanged for the reapings of faith. Now, prayer number six is, Lord, seal my destiny. <laughs> Lord, seal my destiny. So God has a destiny for our life. The ultimate destiny is, of course, heaven, eternal life, right? And that was ratified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. My eternal destiny is secure, not because of me, but because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He cared enough to die for me on a cross and his blood has washed all my sins away. And because I invited the Lord into my life, he has given me the gift of eternal life. So my destiny is sealed from an eternal perspective. But then I have a destiny here on earth. God, what is your plan for my life? Lord, what is your plan for my life and Lord perfect your purposes for me day by day perfect your purposes for me because Lord I'm like a rabbit I like to go on a rabbit trail I get detoured here is God's central purpose for my life and I go on detours I go on rabbit trails so that's why this prayer is so pertinent Lord seal my destiny praise God for eternity it is secure but here on earth I want to live out my life so that I bring maximum honor to the Lord and I make the greatest impact for God's kingdom here on earth. Beloved at the end of each day you and I should be able to say that we have made an amazing impact for God here on earth and we have dented the kingdom of darkness by the way that we live and by the proclamation of the truth and uh, we are living for the Lord we are living for the Lord uh, you know the battle today is God or gold uh, have you ever thought of that God or gold am I going to follow the Lord wholeheartedly or am I going to run off the gold <laughs> and all the gold we leave behind people are going to fight over it after our death and they are going to grab it right so God's plan for me in the now is that God's purposes become reality in my life day in day out. Seal my destiny. Number seven, Lord, direct my focus. Direct my focus. I get distracted so easily. How about you? I know what my central goal is, but easy to lose objectivity so easy to lose objectivity and this is a prayer where we are saying God just like Peter as long as he had his eyes on you Lord he was able to walk on water he was able to accomplish the impossible but when he took his eyes off the Lord and placed it on the circumstances around him that's when he began to sink and Lord I have that sinking feeling and sinking experience a lot of times in my life because I have lost my focus. So here is a prayer to say, Lord, may I keep my eyes always fixed on you, looking unto Jesus and Jesus alone, the author, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12.2. That's the prayer. Looking unto the Lord. Not on my circumstances, not on people, people will disappoint. Not on any government, because governments also disappoint. But keeping my eyes fixed, focused, glued only on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then number eight, Lord, delete 
all negativity in my life. Lord, delete all negativity in my life. You know, uh, when, when you and I use our computers and go into our emails, uh, I get a lot of stuff on email, unbelievable stuff. And most of the time I'm pressing the delete button because there is waste of time. I am not going to even look at it, just delete, 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 delete. And suddenly it hit me, there are a lot of things in my life that need to be deleted. So example, complaining. I sent uh, you all a devotional email recently on that subject, just last week, I believe. Uh, grumbling comes very easily, comes very naturally because we are human. Complaining, right? Complaining. I mean, especially for those of us who fall into the category of perfectionists, everything has got to be perfect. My goodness, uh, uh, the smallest thing is going to irritate us and we are going to start complaining and grumbling, bad, bad attitudes. The thing about bad attitudes is no one will know. Of course they can to some degree know when they read our faces, but bad attitudes, right? The immaturity that we show in our life, immaturity, right? Sometimes I look at people and say, why don't you grow up? You're just like who you were 10 years ago. You're so childish, so immature in your reactions, in your speech, and I struggle with that, both in my life and in the lives of others. So delete, Lord, all negativity in my life. You know, if there are two P words uh, I would like to recommend to you this morning, be a people person and be a positive person. You want to make an uh, impact for the kingdom of God? Be a people person, gravitate towards people. Because God's work is all about people. It's not buildings. <coughs> I'm a project manager for SIM every time I go to uh, Sri Lanka, when I go in May, project manager. It's a lovely title. But uh, SIM knows and I know, behind projects are people. So it's people that we are going to minister to. But for purposes of uh, government, uh, we have to put it as a project manager. Be a people person and be a positive person. Be a positive person. And God can use you in a wonderful way, wherever you are, if you have those two qualities in your life and if I have that quality in my life. Uh, I'm, uh, the Holy Spirit reminded me uh, to put a third P. Don't you like all this extra material you're getting? Right? Uh, be a people person, be a positive person, be a patient person. Ministry requires extraordinary patience. Because everyone is not growing at the same pace, unfortunately. I have fallen into that trap many, many times. I have set expectations, I have been severely disappointed, I have been grieved, I have had sleepless nights. And then the Lord says, be patient. And then I say, Lord, for how long, Lord? I feel like giving them a kick. And the Lord says, you leave that to me. I can give a kick better than you can give. And I said, okay, Lord, all yours. <laughs> right? Number nine. Lord, grant me determination. Determination to press on. Determination not to give up. Determination not to bail out. So, beloved, for those of you who sign up for any kind of ministry, for those of you who have said yes to being part of a committee, yes to being part of a prayer group or a cell group, you and I need the quality of determination to be there, to be committed, right? To serve, to do our part. Because it's so easy to fall by the wayside. So easy to fall by the wayside. And we all need the spirit of determination just to keep going, just to keep going, just to keep going, just to keep going. And one of the things I have learned going to the gym is exactly that determination. 
So I get onto that treadmill and I press the uh, button that says time and I put 30 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I feel like jumping out. <laughs> right? I want to go to the hydro bed where you can lie down and you get a nice blast of hot water on your back. Then I say no. You are committed for 30 minutes, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, look at that guy sweating it out. Okay, just look at him and keep going. So if you look at me after 20 minutes, my tongue is out. There is smoke coming out of my ears and nose. You no, know, I'm huffing and I'm puffing. Hey, but at the end of 30 minutes, you feel great. Oh, I did it. I did it. There is the pizza. <laughs> Number 10, Lord, eradicate disease from my soul and body. I put soul first because there are diseases of the soul that you and I would do well to identify and to eliminate. Diseases of the soul are more important than diseases of the body. So I, I, I have a lot of humor in the prison disease because, you know, all over the place they have put these sanitizers. So these guys, when they are moved from one unit to another unit, they will say, uh, uh, CO, that's how they call the guard, CO, uh, could I use a sanitizer? The guy will say, yes, then go, they'll put, they'll sing, oh, head on. And I sit in a corner and laugh, hey guys, you have pollution of the soul to deal with. What is this you're wiping your hand with the sanitizer? And sometimes the guys will look at me and say, you're, you're not doing that? I said, no. This is more important than this. Right? Now, I'm not saying don't take care of your hygiene. You should. But sometimes we miss the bus. Eradicate disease from my soul and body. And yes, we are concerned about physical illness. We are. And we, uh, we uh, grieve with people who are suffering physically with infirmities. And we look forward to the day when the Lord one day is going to finally eradicate all disease. And we are going to live in a kingdom where there is going to be no disease, no doctors, no death. Have to tuck the doctors in. That's our future. And every time we hear of someone falling ill, it just whets our appetite more and more for that eternal kingdom where there is no more pain, no more tears, no more sickness, no more hospitals, no more needles, no more death. That's our hope. And then uh, number, number 11 is a huge one for me because I struggle with the sin of laziness. And number 11 is, Lord, disturb my ease. Lord, disturb my ease. So the older we grow, and as I'm heading into my retiring age, people have come and said, aren't you going to slow down? Why don't you take it easy? Why don't you cool down somewhat? That's when I start praying this prayer. Lord, I'm hearing these voices that are asking me to take it easy. But God, I want to intensify my efforts for you. My goodness, this mission trip I am going in May, I have over committed myself. And still requests are coming, whether I could give one hour here, one hour there, and they are all, for the most part, speaking assignments. Three youth camps, two four-day uh, conferences at seminaries, morning 8.30 to 4.30 non-stop. And uh, I'm struggling in my preparation, right? I'm, I'm working on about five messages at the same time in my mind, right? And then the call comes, you know, uh, I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary. You were there when we started. Now you've got to come and uh, give us a message of blessing. And man, now it gets added on to the list. But then God reminded me, but you wanted to be delivered from laziness. You wanted to be delivered from taking it easy. And here I'm giving you all these opportunities. So beloved, 
what does your ministry timetable look like? If I were to sit with you and we were going to walk through your ministry timetable, what would it look like? It would be very sad if it is a zero. Truly it will be sad. You and I should be honestly be able to say God is opening amazing doors of opportunity and I want to walk through it. Like next Friday evening. What an incredible opportunity to minister in eight different Alliance churches at the same time. That's because God took my prayer seriously. God disturbed my ease. We have all of heaven to rest, to celebrate our victories. But today is the time for battle, for war, for ministry, for service. With each passing day, we are one step closer to eternity. So beloved, let's all walk to heaven's drumbeat heaven's drumbeat and we are all one day's march closer home with each passing day. Lord disturb my ease. And number 12, so if the first 11 are true, number 12 was very real for me. Number 12, Lord deploy your angels to protect me. Because God, we go into uncharted territory. We go into enemy territory. We want to rescue souls from the edge of hell and we want to bring them home to you, Lord. So we are walking on landmines. Sri Lanka, literally we go into some areas where there are still our landmines. So we need angelic protection. Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and protects them and shields them. And uh, more than we care to admit, we are all vulnerable. We are all vulnerable. And how much we need to come under the protection of our God day in, day out. Deploy your angels to protect me. So we looked at the acknowledgement of the Messiah, the appeal to the Messiah in 12 prayers. Uh, these are my personal prayers. You can add to it. You can delete from it. And it has to lead to point C, adoration of the Messiah. Adoration of the Messiah. So there is singing, there is shouting, there is the spreading of uh, the clothes on the, on the road, and there is the waving of the palm branches. This is a wonderful celebration, the first Palm Sunday. So I want to take the song that was sung, right? Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to God most high. That was the song that was sung, right? Now what can we learn from that? So four things. Intense praise. There was intensity of praise on that first Palm Sunday. So beloved, our worship of God, our praise of God should intensify with each passing moment. <laughs> it should not reduce. It should not reduce. It should intensify. Just shout and sing the praises of your God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a hymn book and just shout and sing. Intense praise. Secondly, your second bullet, intentional praise. Intentional. Uh, you, you could say this was also emotional. Of course, emotions are involved. But this was thought through. This was very intentional. And so, beloved, there will be moments in your life and my life when it almost seems impossible to praise our God. That's when we have to be intentional. I'm going to activate my will and I'm going to praise my God regardless of the circumstance. Intentional. Then uh, thirdly, it actually goes to point number one that we studied together. Insightful praise. Insightful means know who your God is. 
He is master. He is king. He is son of David. He is the prophet. He is God most high. Just from Matthew 21, 1 to 11. Know who your God is. Every time you read the Bible, right? In your journal, you should be recording all the new attributes you are learning about your God. And that's going to be the fuel that you are going to use in your praise time. Insightful praise. And then uh, the fourth one, incessant praise. Incessant means unceasing, unceasing. So one way you can do that is uh, to have uh, uh, on your radio or on your CD to have uh, praise songs going on in the background uh, right through the day and right through the night. And you can join in the singing uh, anytime that uh, you happen to be around it. That's a very beautiful way of doing it, right? So just having music going on, songs of praise and joining in incessant praise. Uh, I want to uh, uh, quote, uh, end with a quote from Spurgeon. Spurgeon just blessed my heart as I prepared this sermon. So uh, Spurgeon says, this is his prayer. <laughs> Lord, open our mouths. Will you underline that? Open our mouths. Far too often we are tongue-tied folks. Our lips are sealed. Far too many times. And Spurgeon is rebuking us this morning. And saying, Lord, open our mouths. Lord, make the quiet ones to tell forth your praise. Some of you hide behind that excuse. Oh, I'm a quiet one. I'm a shy one. You know, I'm a shy one. But how dare you make a lot of noise? So Spurgeon is saying, God, get those quiet ones to tell forth your praise. Our silent tongues deprive us of joy. What a sermon in a statement. Our silent tongues deprive us of joy. Our cowardly reticence robs Christ of his glory and the church of its increase. Do you want to see numerical growth in the church? Hey, let's start praising our God. Let's start praising our God. If the Lord Jesus has done anything for you, or you have seen him do anything for others, bear testimony to it. So our sister Ebele was praying for a job. We prayed last Tuesday that all her records would be released. And today she gave me the good news that uh, everything has been passed and she starts work on Monday. That's cause for rejoicing, praise, thanksgiving. It is the Lord's due and your duty that you should speak to the glory of Christ. And I want to close it with one of the most memorable statements made by Spurgeon on this whole subject of adoring our God. Look at the statement. You, you can almost feel the, the, the passion uh, in, in Spurgeon's heart as you read this. Oh, for a twisted garland of mercies, the roses of gladness and the lilies of delight to bind our hearts to Christ forever. For those of you who love flowers and you are into gardening, man, this statement should resonate big time. Let me read it one more time because it's so good. So good. I wrote it out uh, a few times with my own hand. I recited it out loud a few times and I want to say it one more time. Uh, church, join with me. Okay, why don't you join with me? Let's say it together. Oh, for a twisted garland of mercies, the roses of gladness and the lilies of delight to bind our heart to Christ forever. And so, Lord, we acknowledge you to be the Lord God Almighty, Lord Jesus, you are our Savior, you are our King. Uh, you, you, Lord Jesus, uh, came from heaven in order to set the captive free. We love you, we worship you. Yes, we want our hearts to be bound to you for time and for eternity. We want to be passionate for you, Lord. 
We want to keep falling in love with you over and over and over again. We don't want to be silent. Open our mouths, open our lips so that we can declare your praises, so that we can testify to people of your goodness, your greatness, your glory, your grace. Oh God, release us, release us so that we will become all what you want us to be. And we lay at your feet now our life so that you can take us, so that our destiny in time is sealed with your purposes becoming a reality in each one of our lives. To you alone be all praise and glory both now and forevermore. Amen and Amen. So we are going to sing one more song.